thanks for folks for joining us tonight for the uh, CARA VHF group. And tonight's topic is to uh, talk about and learn about the journey that Patrick and I have been on as we have uh, put together a direction finding antenna with flashing LEDs uh, to indicate uh, direction for uh, which way we should be going to find the transmitter. And uh, to start out, Patrick and I decided we should probably uh, show you what it is that we've done, and then we'll go about telling you how we got there. So we'll hook you with the end product. And uh, so we've got our flashing LEDs, uh, blinky antenna, and uh, first slide, we've got a video of uh, mine in action. So if I click on this, it should play. Is VA6 Julie Whiskey Lima demonstrating our blinky flashing LED direction finding antenna, waiting for the transmission to start. We have our uh, card PCB with red light in the center saying it's on. There we go. Oh, you have to turn, we're too far to the right. There we're centered. And we're too far to the left from the the transmitters box. at the gr the brown box far to the next right the fence centered fox is in the brown bag next or beside the brown bag next to the fence. Uh, here's the setup. Have my radio with the coil uh, audio pickup and dipole antennas. On each side, they're shortened to 37 centimeters. Go back to the direction. Swing from one side to the other and go past the center. Dipoles are shortened to 37 centimeters from the calculated 51 for two meter at the frequency we're working with because the VNA antenna uh, dipole testing showed the biggest dip at uh, 37 <coughs> centimeters at my 146.5 frequency. Uh, back and forth, past, left, Got to go to the right. Um, we tracked this down. Um, I found a YouTube video of uh, uh, the fellow with the uh, flashing LEDs and uh, tried to figure out how to contact him. I couldn't figure it out shared the video with Patrick and he was did a better job of digging and uh, was able to get in contact uh, with uh, NZ1J. Um, I think he's down in New York and Patrick can tell you about how he uh, communicated with the guy and uh, got our next steps. Patrick? I have to say that your blinky works better than mine. I uh... I'm not getting the success that you are, so I'll, I'll sneak up on that one when I get there. Um, I'm going to share my screen because there's various things that I want to show, but the one interesting one is, but if you Google um, NZ1J, here's uh, what I found on uh, YouTube. He's actually uploaded six videos or so, six or seven. So he's not a prolific ham blogger or an information guy. He just basically... Um, presented this little kit. And when I got talking to him by email, it sounds like they have a fairly uh, active um, fox hunting group that they've thrown together. Um, what's interesting, yeah, I was introduced to the product by uh, Wilson, contacted them. He tried, we, he basically is willing to sell the printed circuit boards and the pick chips um, for a couple bucks each, no problem. Send them by mail and people pay by check. 
So I gave him my address and it just stopped him cold in his tracks. And he immediately said, oh, and so I, he was real friendly and, and helpful. So he actually started sending me files by attachment. We decided we're going to make our own. And I uh, ordered, went to order some boards from this company next uh, PCB. And what happens is these guys, you can order the stuff online and they have a minimum order of 10. So we thought, okay, <clears throat> that raises an interesting opportunity. Why don't we order 10 and we can see if we can get a bunch of guys to get together and, and chip in and pay for the, the cost of getting this all together. It turns out to make 10, and there's this little wizard you fill in here. I got it on the page. Um, basically, their minimum order is 10, but you could order 10 for $2. So it was 20 cents per printed circuit board, which is great. And we figured with the cost of the parts and this and that, it's going to be a really inexpensive little toy. The problem is it was something like uh, $45 shipping to get these boards back from China. And you could order China shipping, but it would take months to get it, or you could do it with the FedEx or whatever. So we said, let's go with the higher cost. Let's divide it by 10, we're good. And all we needed to do is find eight people to share the cost with us and we can just rationalize and all that. I even paid $17 duty, import duty, and it was a, a processing fee from uh, uh, to, to uh, process a $1.73 import duty. So it's just, it's kind of weird and crazy. It's just um, amazing. But we got the boards in. I managed to either lose one or I was short shipped. I'm not sure, but we have nine now. So there was nine, nine boards. And um, so that was the easy part. The second part of that was uh, ordering the parts and getting the pick chips program. So I think what I can do is pass it back to Wilson and he can describe the ordering of the parts and putting that together. And I have to say, I'm really impressed, Wilson, with that whole project. Okay. Uh we uh, Patrick has uh, Dave's contact information and some information about his uh, Blinky on on the Kara website, but uh, he had a bill of materials from uh, DigiKey, so uh, I tried to figure my way through a, a DigiKey order and uh, was able to get it off, and I got a uh, bag full of uh, uh, parts with a whole bunch of different components to it and uh, looked at them and said, oh my gosh, if I try to put that together or send a whole bunch of individual parts out to people, they're going to really not know what to do with them because I wouldn't know what one resistor looks like from another. So I, as I took apart the parts from the bags, I put them into little baggies with a label on them with the location on the board that they went into and what it was and et cetera. The labels, the location labels are folded over on these, but this is one of the uh, packages. And uh, when I did my assembly, it really helped because I just worked my day through the little bags and uh, installed them onto the, uh, onto the boards. So here's the, the blank board and loaded up and I call it the porcupine uh, on the bottom with all of the stuff sticking out. I left it sticking out until I was all soldered done and then cut it off. I don't know if that's good practice or not. That's the first board I've ever done. So uh, that's how it worked. And uh, here's uh, the finished product over on the left is uh, laid out with the dipoles stretched out and uh, I folded the dipoles down uh, just with the um, wing nuts to loosen them up and put them down. Patrick went fancy and has, has another system for doing his. Uh, but we have a uh, the PCB board that does the uh, signal processing, uh, picks up a audio coil from the radio and puts it back into the board 
to give the indication of the uh, direction lights. And uh, here's a little bit closer picture. I've had information or advice that I should not use just this 22 gauge wire to come back to the board. I should use coax, but the thing seems to be working and doing a good job. So I'm not sure that I'm going to uh, change and put the coax in. And uh, I mentioned that the dipoles are shortened from calculated 51 centimeters and change for the frequencies I wanted to work at in the, the middle of the band. I uh, hooked it up to the nano VNA. And if I shorten the dipoles down to about 37 centimeters, I got down to a two uh, SWR reading at the bottom of the dip. So uh, I figured I would go with that. I did it first in the basement and was advised that I probably have interference from uh, heating ducts and stuff around in the basement. So I went outside and did it out in the middle of the park and got the same kind of uh, reading. So I'm com more comfortable that this is uh, a reasonable uh, performance expectation. So I maybe now should uh, cut my dipoles off. Still want to leave a little bit of a curve on the end so that it doesn't poke people in the eye. Um, here's the transmitter uh, setup that I put together. Um, I ordered a uh, from uh, Bionics a uh, BFox Con um, Belfing Fox Hunt uh, trend or controller that's on this little card here. He sells it already wired up to plug directly into a uh, Baofeng and with a uh, power supply that theoretically plugs into the extended battery on the back of the Baofeng. Mine, the plug-in doesn't work very well. Um, and on the first Baofeng, the used one I had, I think I overheated the connectors and was getting intermittent connection here. So I sprung for a new Baofeng. So I just drop it into the box and I've got it labeled and can put a cable on it and tie it when it's out transmitting. So it's easy to change the uh, frequency, just reprogram the radio with a different frequency, turn it on with, um, oh, what do you call it? DTMF tones, you can control it. And Dana and I even reprogrammed its timing for uh, when it sends the signals. And uh, that's uh, it for time for questions and discussion, maybe turning to Patrick. Patrick has a little bit of explanation about uh, some of the concepts and the theory and the things that he went through in getting the uh, boards set up and programmed and et cetera. Yeah, I can get into the more technical stuff, but uh, Nero, you have a question, go ahead. I have a question about uh, the placement of the um, transmitter in your video, Wilson. Uh, knowing that Patrick had so much uh, heartburn over chain link fence reflections, <laughs> I was wondering how much that played into uh, the um, uh, blinky light display and if you had a chance to try it against something that wasn't a fence. I have tried it out in uh, more in the middle of the, uh, the park and it seems to work uh, similarly. I've decided this time to put it right next to the fence so that if I was getting a uh, reflection off the fence, it wasn't coming from uh, a, a ways away from it kind of thing. So that it have a more concentrated reflection was my strategy for doing this test. The goal was to, to show the lights blinking rather than a full uh, fox hunt test. So my thoughts are that the only point in tuning the antenna at all is to really improve its ability to detect the um, fox at 
at distance. In other words, you're extending the range of the detector by using the antenna as a front end filter so that it's better at the frequency you want than other frequencies. But at the end of the day, it, if you're picking up the signal on any kind of stupid wire, then you've got the signal and you're good to go. You don't need a tuned antenna. And then even more telling is the fact that you have also the uh, attenuator block there. And, and that comes into play absolutely when you're getting closer to the Fox and you find that you're getting a lot of low power reflections, you can tune those out by using the attenuator. So the, the tuned antenna is the first part to find the Fox at a distance. And then as you get closer, you, you, you know, it's not nearly as important. The other thing, just from my own personal experience, you, uh, you bent over the wires. I did the same thing here. And when I cut the ends off, it was a completely different frequency. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't be so presumptuous that you can just get your snippers out and bend it, cut it at the bend, play with it a bit. And um, I made a, another antenna dipole for aviation band. And I did exactly what you're describing. And uh, by knowing the velocity factor of your wire, then you can easily make an antenna perfect length, but folding it over doesn't, it isn't actually the same as not being there. It's, it, it might be if the wire was touching and if it was really close together, but you've got now this fairly weird kind of capacitive end load on the, on the dipole and it's gonna be different when you change that, right? Oh, okay. I, it's interesting that the velocity <laughs> factor of the dipole wire works out about to that 37 centimeters. Exactly. Patrick, uh, why don't you take us through some of your uh, process of programming our chips and uh, getting the, uh, the boards, because we had a reference to CID in that. Yeah, um, so I don't know quite in terms of sequence, um, what to show next, but what I'm gonna do is, is talk about the, the PIC chip. So this whole circuit is designed around a processor called PIC and it, my first experience. So this is me learning. I, you'd think at 68 years old, I'd have learned this by now, but suddenly I discovered there's this whole industry out there that I knew nothing about. And um, <clears throat> so what is PIC? And, and when we look at different um, projects, you find that you stumble on PIC quite often. And what I've got is a uh, website, Microchip is the company. And I'm just going to share my screen because there's something really interesting I'm going to sh show you guys. So the company that uh, makes the PIC chip is Microchip. And if I go down to their solutions on their web page, and I'm just going to hover over one item here, medical. They make chips and stuff for industrial control systems. So just in the medical alone of this list of industries that they have solutions for. You're looking at uh, clinical devices and dr drug delivery devices and um, um, all kinds of different technologies that they dabble in. And so they know their stuff. And, and the thing is that it's not consumer grade electronics, it's industrial electronics. And so that's why it's relatively unfamiliar to me. Um, so I, I was digging into, you know, how does this all work? And, and why, would, why would we in fact bother using a PIC chip when, um, sorry, here we go, when um, Arduinos are kind of the thing of the day? So here's the answer right here. A PIC chip is usually under two bucks or retail and your, your cheapest uh, Arduinos are in the 15 to $20 range, although you can get them cheaper, but the microchip PIC chips are designed for industrial environment they're in des designed for low power, low size, and low cost. So that's kind of their sweet spot. So that was the, um, the product that this uh, Blinky was built around. So clearly Dave either understands this or he has somebody who's fed him that. But the uh, Bionics, uh, as an example, the Bionic Microfox, I looked at the chip with my little microscope uh, camera that I got, and sure enough, it's a PIC chip as well. So for sure, it's out there. The thing about PIC, though, is that you need to have some hardware and, of course, software to program the darn thing. And I managed to uh, source this little device right here, Kit 3.5. It turns out that this is a Chinese knockoff from a, 
a, a product that pick or the microchips sell themselves called kit pick kit three. Okay. And then it plugs in with some cables to a, a device or whatever that you connect your chip to. So most of the industrial environment, they don't have this part of it, the, uh, the socket. They, they just have a, a header plug that the, the cables plug into from this. And this actually is pretty close to the same technology as the, um, the really low end Arduino nanos and so on, where you need those extra cables and so on, right? Um, I guess, so that describes the pick. What I had to do was um, figure out how to program it and then flash all of the uh, chips and I got that sorted out and then we're able to go and build the darn things, right? Um, so um, I think I have a picture later on here. Yeah, here we go. So on the board, this is a little bit blurry, but you can see uh, on the board, there's two different spots for connecting a uh, diode. And the small little guy right here is a surface mount diode. And that was what the bill of materials identified was necessary. And, oh, that's a bugger to solder. You can see the size of it. I don't know if you're familiar with um, resistors and, and even regular diodes, but I mean, that whole screen, my finger would be twice the size of that picture right there. So to solder these guys in would be a heck of a job. I tried soldering the first pair that I had and I was holding the, the chip with a set of tweezers and trying to solder it and my finger slipped on the tweezers and boop, it was gone. Like this thing just disappeared mm -hmm. somewhere in the carpet in my room and I'm done, right? And so Doug offered, he says, I've got the equipment to do that. So he has actually a microscope and he took all of our boards and the diodes and he soldered them up for us. So he soldered up the remainder of them. You know, we, we were short. We figured in retrospect, we should have ordered a bunch of extra so that we could do that. We could lose a few. <laughs> they looked they looked full size, the same size as the uh, resistors on the screen that I was ordering from. Yeah, but they're not. But you can see here, this is quite interesting, is the board that uh, Dave had designed. You could put one or the other um, diodes in there. Now, normally they would be paired and you can see what happened with me. I actually damaged one of the diodes. I was trying to troubleshoot mine and I ended up breaking the lead off and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm done. Thanks to Doug for soldering it, but I managed to wreck it anyway. <laughs> so I, I put in the one diode and uh, it fixed my problem. So I think it works, but maybe what I should do is undo this one and put in the other diode. And when I asked Dave about like it seems so much easier to put in the full size diodes. Why not do that? And his response, although he didn't say exactly why, he said it seemed to work better with the surface mount diodes. They're a different part number and they maybe have different specifications, but uh, right. fundamentally the bigger diodes work, but it may not be quite as clear. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do is get into the theory of operation of how these guys work. If that's um, applicable. I, I'm not sure if we're boring everybody at this point, but I can do that. Um, the thing I wanted to point out was the tone that happens. So let me start with the basic um, TDOA, time difference of arrival. So this is the circuit that uh, I got from uh, the article that Dana had found that talks about TDOA. And the way it works is this, there's two diodes here. One's facing into and the other one's facing away from the circuit. And then there's this timer that, as Dana describes, it's just running a square wave that's switching the diodes, one's on and one's off, depending on the waveform. Now, I have an actual oscilloscope trace showing the voltage at that center point between those diodes. And you can see clearly that it's, it's on half the time and it's off half the time, 50% duty cycle, right? Now, the way that works is, and I have a link here, so I'm going to try and um, tease you guys with this. Here's the TDOA, and I'm only going to play a few seconds of it, but you can hear that tone, that steady tone. That's pretty close to being... And the tone drops out when it's null, and then you get the... You get that audible tone in your ear 
when it's off, when it's out of phase, when the antenna is different. Now, it's about neutral right there. The other part of this, when I get really close to the fox, the fox is in this little red container right there. You can also get very close to the. Uh, it works just great. Beacon, even so even right up to the thing, thing, right? Amazing. But it's the tone that explains everything here. So I'm going to just stop that and go back to the document here. Um, Basically, this is switching back and forth. And if you can read it, I don't know if it's big enough here, but this frequency of that signal is 700 hertz, just, just shy of 700 hertz. So 700 is in the audible tone, and that's what it sounds like, right? Everybody with me on that? You can nod your head mm -hmm. if you got it. Okay. So the thing that that doesn't do is it doesn't tell you which antenna is better at picking up the signal. It only tells you when there's a null. So you're only able to tell if it's in front of you or behind you and that's it. So the, the um, blinky adds to that, but here's the difference. The blinky, if I play this video and I, I'm gonna slow the speed down so that you can uh, hear it and, and uh, hopefully I can do that. So bear with me while I try and play my tricks here, slowing this down. I play the video first. Do you hear that tone? It's constant tone. It's much higher pitch, but you should be able to hear that, right? Not the signal, but the tone that's above that, right? Now, the Blinky is running with a 1700 hertz oscillation frequency of the antenna. So the radio is interpreting that as a uh, modulated signal and it's a 1700 hertz it's a lot higher and it's harder to distinguish and it's a it's a it's not as clear to the ear right now this video that i'm showing you is the problems that i'm having with my blinky that the lights go into what i call an epileptic mode where it's not giving me a clear indication of which side it is the the uh, fox is actually on the right hand side of this picture and if I play this again, what you'll see is the only time the two green lights come on on the left, sorry, on the right, is when the audio signal actually drops off. Like when I have only carrier. Now, having said that, if you listen carefully to this thing, so I, what I'm looking for is listen to what the tone is and what the audio signal is at the moment that I have two green like that. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit from that and then I'm gonna play it and it's playing at half speed. So I won't bore you anymore with that, but uh, if you're, if you're Watching that closely, what you'd see is when the Morse code was coming, the gaps between the words was when it was solid green and it was great. So the, the tones are confusing the blinky. And if I look at the actual um, um, signal, here's this, here's the dual trace showing each of the two, the base of the antennas. And you can see that <clears throat> the antennas are on not a 50-50 duty cycle, but actually it's like 60% and this is 60%, but they overlap a little bit on this side and a little bit on this side of each pulse, right? So the, the way it works, if I go back to the schematic, there's two antennas, two, two diodes. This picture here shows four diodes, but clearly there's only two and you have a choice of one or the other. But this pick chip is flipping the, the um, antennas on or off individually and it can choose to turn them on both or one or the other. So that's how it's doing it. And it's doing it at a higher frequency. <sighs> so I hope I haven't bored you with too much with that, but here's uh, the next thing. Let, 
see if I've got it here. So what I'm showing on the screen here is pretty interesting, but it's kind of a little bit overwhelming and, and hopefully uh, I can, I can uh, explain what's happening. What I have is a spectrum display of the audio from two different audio clips. What we're looking at is the one on the left is the um, Microfox playing. This is the source audio. And what I did was I recorded it and then I played it back through the Baofeng to see how the blink would work. And the blinky worked great. It loved it. It's the actual Microfox sending it that it doesn't like. But what you're seeing here is all of the tones up and down, up and down that make the annoying, you know, here I am. And then here's the Morse code at the end. And so you can see the Morse code. If I was able to expand this, this is just a screenshot. But if I was able to expand that out, I'm sure Nero could tell us exactly what the Morse code is saying. It may be a little bit tight right here, but the idea is that uh, it's tones. Now, here's something really interesting to look at is this is a, a spectrum display. So for this frequency right here, so if I look over on this chart and I, it's kind of small print for you guys, I'll see if I can zoom in. There we go, look at me. Uh, that's around 800 to 900 hertz tone, right? Well, look at what happens here is at the, two, the first harmonic, or sorry, the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic, it's, it's splashing that tone all the way up into the, the audio band. It's just a mess, right? And the same thing here, if I look back, I've got these tones happening for the uh, beeping of the thing. I've got splashing of audio all the way up, right? It's horrible. Now, if I scroll the screen over and look at the one on the right, this is me recording the audio that's received from the Blinky. So essentially this is the input from the Microfox and this is the result on the Blinky. And you can see right here at, there's between 1600 and 1800, there's 1700. That's the frequency of the oscillation of the antennas, which is discerned or it's discriminated by the receiver as a tone. But you notice that I've got lots of noise from the other signals and even the Morse code here that's at the same frequency. It's like they, they just splash into each other, right? And the only time they don't, and if I was to highlight this a little bit more over here, the only time they don't is when I have a dead air between the Morse code words. And that's when the Blinky loves it. it it's got the two green lights on, it's happy. When it's got a nice clean code, that uh, a, a signal that's not being messed with by an overlay of some audio that isn't really helpful. And that's why the Blinky is such a problem for me <laughs> with the micro, the micro Fox, right? Does that, Makes sense. And the other thing to, to notice is the the I'm receiving this um, 1700 hertz tone, but I'm also getting the second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. It's a royal mess as well, right? <laughs> and I'm sure if I took an audio of uh, Wilson's uh, Bofang, I'm willing to bet I have a significantly lower amount of harmonics and splash there. I'm I'm willing to bet that it's just a whole bunch better. That's that's my assumption anyway so yeah so so this, this thing is is determining the direction based on what phase that audio signal is and right. so it's 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 creating the audio it's by switching the antennas back and forth that is inducing audio onto the received signal and this is the tone that that you hear superimposed on the signal coming out of the radio um, and because it's the microcontroller that's controlling the switching of the antennas, um, it knows when, hey, I was on the right-hand uh, side antenna right now, and it can sort of set the clock at zero for that. And then when it goes through a full cycle, it can end up again. And so we can actually figure out what the phase difference actually was. Um, in the, uh, the TDOA one that Pat was showing, you know, you're listening for the audio, but, um, you know, human ear, not so good at figuring out what phase it was. We're just not that fast. Um, but the, the microcontroller is. 
And so it, it tries to figure out where the phase is. Well, the problem is that because the thing is, it's, it's basically inducing um, an audio into an FM receiver. And so for these things, it actually does need to be an FM receiver for, for it to work properly. Because playing with the antenna the way that it is, um, it looks like an audio signal modulated onto an FM carrier or onto a, uh, to a carrier, right? So it's, a, it's an FM signal. Um, if the transmitted tone uh, or signal contains that same audio tone, it's going to mix and kerfuffle with the locally generated one and screw it up. And this is why, we, and, and so what we saw, what we can see in the spectrogram there is that the second harmonic of the generated audio from the transmitter um, is, is in the audio band uh, is, is actually coinciding with the, the locally generated frequency. And it's, uh, that's why the, the, the lights are doing a, a dance you know, a dance disco move um, there when it's when it's seeing that and so and even some of the other tones they're to varying degrees and that's why you see it go from full right a uh, full right indication to kind of left and right left right and one and then just the middle and it's changing around is it's different levels of interference coming in from the transmitter the uh, the time wave you can actually see it in the time waveform of of that uh the, the more pure generated signal. It's very square in that. And if you've ever looked at Fourier series and whatnot, um, like a pulse excitation into a system um, is, is a square wave, right? Just on off. Um, and that actually has a frequency spectrum, well, theoretically to infinity, right? It's, uh, it's just so it, it excites every frequency that exists. Um, and this is one way of determining resonant frequencies of systems. You pulse it and you look at what rings. Um, and then, and, and, okay, there's some resonance of some kind there. Um, but uh, but yes, yeah, so whenever you have things that are very squarish and are not evenly rounded off, you get more harmonics, right? And it's the same kind of thing. If, if, you, if you go with, if we transition to the RF side, you'll see frequency shift keying modulations and you'll see GFSK, right? And this is where they've, they've, they've tried to, they try to kind of tune how the change, how, how things are happening to reduce the amount of harmonics that come out of your uh, transmission, right? That they're basically making it less of a square transition when, when they're doing that. Um, but this also happens with audio stuff. And so uh, we can only guess, I guess we don't have uh, signals from Wilson set up there, but I would imagine that if you feed a signal into the microphone circuit of even a Baofeng radio, um, the various filters that are on the audio in there um, will actually smooth that out some and you'll get less of the harmonics in the audio range from it. Whereas the MicroFox is probably doing a direct digital synthesis, uh, synthesis uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the audio uh, and it's feeding it straight into um, a cheap transmitter chip that's on board. And so it's feeding it directly into it um, without much filtering and so if, if you did want to modify the Fox to, to have less harmonics in the audio, um, you, you probably could figure out an audio filter, probably a capacitor in the audio line that, that, would, uh, that would kind of even out some of those. Very good, Dana. Very good. As I've done trying to figure out what I wanted to do <clears throat> for transmitter and et cetera, and considered the Arduinos, I remember reading that some people basically said that the uh, transmitter uh, chips that you just described, Dana, are uh, very splashy or wide uh, spectrum output, that they're not very, very clean. Some of what Baofangs have been accused of as well, but uh, even worse. And so I yeah, think this, and, and is so a, this is a demonstration of that. Uh, not quite, no. Um, and, and so, so it, it could be something that exists in there, but what you're going to see as the, uh, the RF transmitter, um, generating a bunch of extra harmonics, um, you're going to see signals, uh, up, up the band, uh, and whatnot in for RF. But, uh, what we're looking at is actually what's modulated inside the RF. And so, so, so we actually, we actually may have both happening at the same time. <laughs> uh, what we're witnessing, uh, so, so what we're observing with the, the, the disco lights, um, it, it is going to be. Uh, the, just from the audio and and not uh, not to do with the RF. Um, although if if the oscillator is not stable and stuff, I mean it, it's gonna your your 
carrier that you're modulating is not going to be steady, right? And, and you know, the steadier that that is, um, the, 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 the more consistent results you're going to get. And so, so if that's wavering a little bit, then that's also going to have an effect on it, right? Because it's, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out phase of an audio, um, wave and then if you if you have like a you know, little extra bump in the audio wave um if we're tell me how many wavelengths you're looking at to determine your phase um it's going to um you know if you, if you bump it a little bit it's going to change the phase on you um and 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 then of course if it's um uneven oscillator it's probably going to be random and so so and if that's random it's it's, it's yeah it's going to be basically a fuzzier um discrimination of the signal so but um it actually it occurred to me while you're talking as though the interests of the different groups might be different um is that if your primary interest is let's go find an elt that's been set off on an aircraft um, which is one of the direction finding things uh, related to some search and rescue tasks maybe you might want to know what that signal they transmit looks like because if you want to use a tool like this one you could have a similar kind of conflict in in your equipment but also because they're most of them i imagine they're pretty consistent in what they do um you actually might be able to design your equipment to 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 avoid those kinds of potential conflicts so i'm wondering if we've covered everything or if i Wilson, did I miss I, any of the stuff I, I we think, talked about? I think we've talked about everything. One thing that I wanted to uh, point out about our, our process, I showed the video of the Blinky to my eight-year-old grandson, and he looked at it and he said, they've got the colors wrong. The, the good direction should be green, and the outsides should be red. And then she'd have a yellow and a red. So it has <laughs> yeah. progressive. So uh, when I was ordering the parts, I ordered a, a bunch of extra LEDs for my own stock. So I'm going to check and see. Uh, I have a kit to make up for his dad, his family. And uh, maybe I'll put the reds on the outside and the green in the center for uh, his uh, blinky. I, I, I did. I don't, would that work though? Because the, the lit up side, or you might have to reverse it because the lit up side is where you want to turn towards. And so maybe green in the center, yellow on, on the outside, and then have the obverse <laughs> side red or something. Time. So. <clears throat> so I did realize I, I, I forgot one segment of my presentation that I was planning, and that's to show my actual unit. So, Wilson, you showed yours. That's great. And uh, I 3D printed a case for it. And um, the, the 3D print job, this is actually not a picture, it's live. I can show my unit here, but I also um, 3D printed a, uh, a bracket for the battery. So that was easy. I found that on the web and away we went. Um, and I got my son to do a battery uh, 3D printed. And when I showed the um, antenna to the Caratels group, Nick said, you should uh, get a plexiglass or something to cover that board in case it rains. So yeah. there's, <laughs> there's more steps to do of uh, 3D around the board and a cover and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, for me, building the case is a, a multi-step process. That was my revision seven of the case. And I was only working on the bottom half. <laughs> so I reached a point of functionality where it's good enough. I'm going to carry on. I also um, designed these uh, holders for the um, brackets for the antenna. So I, I know this is kind of messy, but what I did was I, I designed these to 3D print so that I just have one, um, one bolt in the center. And then when you fold out the antennas, they're, they're, uh, it's just one 3D print job, but I print quantity two of them. And then I can lock it into place like this. And uh, hopefully that makes sense. You can see the, the sticks on each side and, and that little plastic thing is just a, a convenient single. Um, that uh, is, single that is so cool. Yeah. It looks nice. Very, very it, neat. It could be improved a little bit, but that was the deal. Now, the one thing that I figured out, and this is just a um, suggestion if anybody's making this, and I think there's still a couple of you, uh, I've got this heavy stiff wire for my antenna and that's where I got the velocity factor and everything. I decided to put a little 
short piece of flexible braid wire here so that it flexes when I'm doing the in and out there. And one of the things that I see as a problem, a design problem is that the attachment of the um, coax for the radio, and then I also used coax here for the antennas, these are fairly frail. I mean, I'm really not pleased with that. So I would suggest um, put in, like a new design to this would be to actually have an SMA connector on the side of the board. And, um, and that way that it'll provide a whole bunch of strain relief and uh, um, connection uh, integrity is what I was looking for. So I, I put a uh, strain relief uh, on the uh, antenna wire that TPOG, uh, where it left the, uh, the base, I, I put a uh, loop around the wire so that it wouldn't get pulled off by the radio connection. Right. right. Well, in the perfect world, then the case, I would have a hole. And, and in, in my design, I'd have an upper and a lower half that would be split right in the middle of the hole. And then you could put a uh, tie wrap or something on the inside of the case so that the strain relief is inside yep. but that's just another way to do it the the challenge for me was to come up with a case design that i could snap the two pieces together and have all the screws and everything and i'm sort of i'm, I'm working on a universal design not just specifically for this one but i was really pleased this gave me the standoff and the rigidity that i needed for um testing it and then off we go and i've already replaced the soldering on the battery about three times bro broke it off at least that many times in my travels yeah any uh any questions anyone has i think it was a great presentation and uh yes. it's uh, certainly inspiring to see what you're doing we we had fun uh working on it together uh, some of the times there was some hair seemed like it was pulling out when the uh uh service mount chips disappeared and et cetera. I would have ordered extras if I had uh, realized their, uh, their size and the loss rate. 